Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Larry McNabney? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. This case involves a woman named Laren Sims, who went by many aliases, and a victim named Larry McNabney. I'll start with a background of Laren Sims. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Laren Sims was born in Attleboro, Massachusetts on January 20, 1966. She moved to Florida at a young age. That's where she went to high school. It was reported that her IQ was 140. So a standard deviation on an IQ test is 15 points. So she was about 2.67 standard deviations above the mean. That's incredibly intelligent. She did not finish high school. She had a number of romantic relationships. She married, had a daughter, and was divorced by the age of 20. Later, she would have a son with a different man. Sims became active criminally. Specifically, she started stealing. She was arrested for grand theft in January of 1989. More charges would follow, including burglary and petty theft, apparently stemming from the same incident. She started writing bad checks when she was on probation. She also went to Tampa to watch a hockey game without getting permission from her probation officer. She would go to jail for nine months for violating probation. She was released. When she was still on probation, she took one of her boss's credit cards and used it to make purchases for herself. She was sent back to jail. When she was released the next time, she had to wear an ankle monitor. In March of 1993, she was facing more jail time for violating probation. She cut off her ankle monitor and left town with her daughter Haley, who was about eight years old. Her son lived with his father, so she didn't take him. Sims would end up in Las Vegas. There she continued her criminal activity. She was known for using aliases. She had 38 altogether in her criminal career. Initially, she used the name Elisa Barash. This was the name of a woman she met in prison. Sims had obtained her social security number. I guess Barash had missed the prison class on preventing identity theft. Maybe she figured she could trust everyone who was in there. Sims met a man named Ken Rattlesberger. He immediately became infatuated with her. Sims and her daughter moved into his house. Sims found one of his credit cards and ran up a number of charges without his permission. He asked her to move out. But after a few weeks, she had worked her way back into his house. They would get married in 1994. Sims continued to spend much more money than she was making. She would go out in the afternoon and at night and not say anything about where she was going. Her husband found her to be elusive. Using the name Elisa Rettelsberger, she applied for a job as a secretary at a law firm in Las Vegas in 1995. The lawyer who owned the firm was named Larry McNabney. He liked her and offered her the job. Sims and Ken Rettelsberger would get divorced around the same time. Sims had taken about $30,000 from him during their marriage. Sims and McNabney started seeing each other romantically. She moved in with him not long after. He caught her stealing money from his wallet the day after they moved in together. Later that same year, the Nevada State Bar investigated McNabney's law firm. They concluded it embezzled more than $140,000 from clients. McNabney realized that Sims was responsible. He told her not to do that again. McNabney closed his legal offices in Las Vegas and in Reno and moved to Sacramento, California. There he set up a new office. In 1996, Larry McNabney married Laren Sims. He was 17 years older than her and had been married four times before. Sims then referred to herself as Elisa McNabney. I guess McNabney was not really worried about that whole embezzlement thing. Seems like that's something he should have noticed, but I guess he had other priorities. In addition to marrying her, McNabney also allowed her to work in his law firm along with a 19-year-old secretary who was hired in the spring of 2000. Her name was Sarah Dutra. Sims and Dutra became close. They were both fascinated with pop culture and pictured themselves as celebrities. They took on kind of an us-against-the-world mentality as they both clashed with McNabney. He did not like Dutra at all, yet he continued to employ her. McNabney's drinking behavior had always been a problem for him. 
but it was becoming more pronounced. He was also depressed. He was becoming increasingly irresponsible with finances and spending more time with his horses. He would often attend horse events. McNabney allowed Sims to hire a new secretary who could do the work of Dutra because she was hanging out with Sims all the time and not getting any work done. Sims and Dutra were also using an incredible amount of marijuana and they would frequently go to parties. Sims wanted to maintain her lifestyle and started to see McNabney as an obstacle. She decided to murder him. Apparently Dutra was supportive of this tactic. Sims and Dutra started poisoning McNabney with horse tranquilizer using a Visine bottle. He wasn't dying quickly enough for Sims, so on September 10, 2001, Sims and Dutra injected him with horse tranquilizer in a Los Angeles hotel room. All three of them were attending a horse show in Los Angeles. Sims and Dutra were seen pushing McNabney out of the hotel in a rented wheelchair and putting him into his pickup truck. He was still alive at this point, but he could not resist effectively because of the tranquilizer. They drove him to Yosemite National Park with the intent of burying him. He was not dead, so they brought him back to Sacramento and administered additional doses of tranquilizers. Larry McNabney would die on September 12, 2001. Sims and Dutra kept McNabney's body in a refrigerator in the garage of his house for several months before transporting his body to a nearby winery in Linden, California. This is where the police would find his body on February 5, 2002. They looked for Sims, but she had already converted the couple's assets into cash, more than $500,000. She was nowhere to be found. A nationwide manhunt was initiated. Sims had switched to a different alias and drove to Florida. She was hiding at the house of a friend of her daughter, Haley. She turned herself into the authorities on March 20, 2002, and confessed to her crimes. One week later, on March 31, which was Easter Sunday, she brought an end to her life by hanging when she was in her jail cell. She left a note behind in which she asked her attorney to sue the jail for not preventing her suicide. She wanted the money to go to her children. She said her actions spared her children from having to watch her trial on court TV, and they could move on with their lives without a heavy burden. The state of California had enough evidence to charge Sarah Dutra with first-degree murder, but the confession of Laren Sims was hearsay. The judge would not let it be used as evidence against Dutra. Ultimately, Dutra was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter and being accessory to murder and sentenced to the maximum penalty, 11 years and 8 months in prison, she was released in just over nine years, in August of 2011. Now moving to my analysis. Laren Sims appeared to have a number of characteristics, many of which were quite obvious to those around her, but others she was able to disguise. She was intelligent, selfish, manipulative, deceptive, charismatic, impulsive, greedy, flirtatious, and focused on her appearances. She appeared to be both narcissistic and psychopathic. It would appear that Sims was able to manipulate so easily, in part by using the fact that men thought she was attractive. Men would overlook behaviors like stealing in order to continue having sex with Sims. Sims was proficient at making a good first impression. She dressed in nice clothes. She wanted to appear classy. She maintained a demeanor that made her look like an elite, a celebrity. She felt as though she was better than other people, and she wanted to look the part. She knew how to sidestep tough questions. She would switch the topic of a conversation away from something she wanted to avoid. When she interviewed for jobs, an offer was soon to follow. When Sims interviewed with McNabney, she said that she had a master's degree in business administration. McNabney told people that he thought Sims was lying about her education. Yet, of course, he still hired her. She encouraged him to drink, even though he had a history of substance use problems. This didn't seem to bother him. There were many warning signs available for McNabney. One could argue there were nothing but warning signs. It wasn't like just one or two red flags. It was like a battalion of red flags going on a riot and setting themselves on fire. Friends and associates of McNabney felt as though he was a shrewd business person, and he should have known what he was in for with Sims. They suggested that the romantic interactions between the two must have been phenomenal in order for McNabney to overlook Sims' destructive behavior, essentially saying that perhaps the two were using each other. McNabney was using Sims for sex, 
and Sims was using McNabney for money. Even if this was the case, McNabney was aware that Sims lying and stealing were not the only problems. He had written a note to a former love interest saying that if anything happened to him, his wife would be the one responsible. I've seen this situation in many cases. For example, there was something like this in the Susan Powell case, where she had indicated that her husband, Joshua Powell, might murder her. If someone finds themselves telling another person that if they die unexpectedly, their spouse murdered them, it might be time to look at the pros and cons of the marriage. No matter how that analysis goes, what kind of pro can outweigh a con of dying? On the one hand, they make me breakfast in bed. On the other hand, they might kill me. It's really not hard to figure that one out, right? That one seems pretty clear, mostly because of the dying part. Let's look at the potential personality profile for Laren Sims. She was high in openness to experience. She was creative, like coming up with all those aliases. And she had a massive investment in fantasy. She was fascinated with the good life. She identified with works like The Great Gatsby. And she was fascinated with Bonnie Parker from Bonnie and Clyde. Sims had low conscientiousness. She was impulsive. She took whatever she wanted. She didn't think about the consequences. She had high extroversion. She was sensation-seeking, outgoing, and assertive. Low agreeableness. She was distrusting and antagonistic. And she had mid-range neuroticism. She didn't seem to be particularly depressed or anxious, but she did have trouble resisting temptation. There are many elements of this case that stand out. One in particular is the relationship between Sims and Dutra. Sims was living a lie. She had little regard for the rights of others or the law. But Dutra had no criminal history. When Dutra met Sims, Dutra would end up turning into a killer. The prosecutors believed that Sarah Dutra was actually much worse than Sims, more vindictive and more callous. For example, when Sims and Dutra took McNabney to Yosemite National Park, Dutra started digging a hole. She was going to bury him alive. It was Sims who decided they needed to go back to the residence and wait for McNabney to die. It's incredible that Sims and Dutra were able to get away with their crime for as long as they did. They were unbelievably obvious criminals, like pushing McNabney out of a hotel in a wheelchair. They were literally killing him at that time, and they took him out in broad daylight. The lies that Sims fabricated to explain where McNabney had gone were ridiculous and inconsistent. When she sold his truck, she told the buyer that her husband had joined a cult, and he was much happier now. He no longer had need of worldly possessions. I guess this explained why she was wearing his Rolex. Other people heard different stories from her, like her husband was in rehab. I think this speaks to the value of confidence. Sims was able to live a lie. It didn't bother her that she was a fraud. It came naturally. She was able to lie every day for about 10 years, and it didn't really seem to affect her performance. Instead of considering herself fortunate that she was able to escape the law, she continued to commit crimes. In the end, when it looked as though her life was going to be spent in prison, she decided she was not willing to endure the consequences of her actions. If she could no longer live on her terms, she was not going to live at all. Those are my thoughts on the case of Larry McNabney and Laren Sims. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.